Hello, everyone, and welcome back. Got a fun one for you today, a little bit of trauma. This is an 80-year-old who was riding her bike and went over the handlebars. The general dentist thought that they may have just been luxated, but as you'll see here, looking through the comb beam, pretty nasty root fractures on both 7 and 8. Always important to evaluate trauma cases with a comb beam because it gives you such a better picture of what's going on here. You can see on 7, it is... The, both the fracture is completely below the bone level, which is what we want. On 8, though, not only is it above the bone level, there's a large class 5 there to begin with. So let's talk about the evaluation. Normally, I'd be taking pictures of all this, but because I have the video, this is fine. But if you've watched my lecture on trauma, it is important to document all of this just in case there was a... Uh, ever to be a lawsuit involved with uh, one party suing the other party, things like that. If you, The more information you have, the better. So thankfully, a video is very much awesome for this sort of thing. And I just wanted to show how I go through the process of evaluating it. So very gentle here, not having the patient. Notice I'm not doing percussion. This is the last time in the world you'd want to do percussion because the patient's already in so much pain. All I'm doing is just gently tapping on the teeth, very light pressure, just to see which ones are tender. Thankfully, it was only seven and eight. Now what I'm doing is checking for the PDL, any bleeding along the sulcus, any probing depths, anything that might be of issue. And thankfully, these two looked okay. You'll see here in a second that the facial of number eight was pretty bad. Now, unfortunately, she was, this was, I mean, maybe a day post-ox accident. So she's still very tender in this area. So I wasn't able to completely evaluate that class five along number eight, but you can see the crack right there. And when we actually repair it in a second here, you'll be able to see that a little bit better. Take lots of photos along this area as well. Very useful for communication with the dentist. And what I'm trying to do here is see if I can't feel the fracture along the buckle on number seven. And thankfully, we're good there. Now, what we're going to do is some cold testing, make sure everything feels it. And I always test at a minimum of six through 11, just to make sure we get a baseline because oftentimes you can have transient lack of loss of cold sensitivity, things like that. So it's important to test, 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 test multiple teeth. You can see she jumped right there on number nine. So we knew that one was going to be okay. No real response on number eight, but on an 80 year old, that's pretty normal as well that I wouldn't expect to see a ton there. Um, less of a response on number 10 here, but I believe eventually she did feel a little bit. There you go. And then real gentle here while testing both of these because they're so loose. I didn't expect to really have any cold sensitivity on either of these teeth because they were the traumatized ones, but it's important to have a baseline. That way you can compare it to something after. You can see she's not really responding to either of these teeth. Once again, not a surprise, but uh, important to hold it there for quite some time, especially on someone who's in their 80s, just because there's going to be more calcification to these teeth to begin with. So at this point, you can see how bad that is. She has been numbed by now. So this is the second video. That's why I'm able to be a little bit more aggressive. So what we're going to show from here on out is the process by which I'm going to reposition these teeth. You can really appreciate just how mobile they are right there with my fingers as well. So that's what I was check checking. And then going to look at the rest of the teeth. I just wanted to make sure there wasn't any um, bleeding spots on number nine. I didn't see any when I was doing the eval, but a lot easier to tell once they're nice and numb. So it's pretty straightforward here doing the splints. I'm going to use a rib-on splint. That's my preferred option for this sort of thing. Uh, I have a knockoff one that I get from eBay because of course I do. <laughs> but the first thing I'm going to do is cover the exposed dentin on number nine. That's one of the most important things because the, the theory is that if the tooth has been traumatized, you're going to have a lack of blood flow for a little bit, which could allow for bacteria to travel through the, the dentinal tubules to the pulp and cause pulp necrosis. So that's why I'm going in here with a little bit of vitrobond, just covering those exposed dentinal areas to make sure we don't have any any path for the bacteria to get inside there. It'll also help with sensitivity because the fluoride has a calming effect on the nerve, the pulp tissue as well. So that's what we're going to do there. Pretty straightforward. That's all we had to do to take care of number nine. She will be seeing her general dentist eventually for the restoration on that one. He's extremely talented. I'm not worried about that. The those at all. Now I did notice here that the crack, as you can see, is quite large. I already talked with her that this tooth is not going to be worth saving, unfortunately, but it does serve a purpose here in the short term of it can help stabilize number seven better than number nine a tooth away could. So what I'm going to do here is use that same 
um, Vitrabond in the class five site to help kind of hold the two pieces together. We already know this tooth isn't going to be worth saving. It's going to need to be extracted. So it's not like this is a, you know, a problem. It has to hold on for maybe a month at most. And that's all I really need to get out of it. So this is what we're doing here, like here, there, and I'm holding it from behind with my finger to help get it into the proper position. And I'm feeling with my finger where number nine is and pushing it back to that spot. So it's a lot more stable here. And that's pretty much how that process goes. So we've finished with the Vitrabond at this point, and we'll start the process now of making the splint. So as I alluded to earlier, I like using the ribbon ones. You can use a variety of different things. Fishing line is one of the most popular, very easy to use. And you can also use um, ortho wire. Now I just happen to have ribbon in the office. And so very easy to quick kind of measure out how far we need to go. Cut that using some scissors or a 15 blade, and then we'll start the process. Now how this material works, it's a, fi it's a fiber reinforced resin kind of fiber pretty much that as you fill it with bonding agent and flowable it will solidify a little bit more so what we're doing here is just getting this process all ready i'm double checking to make sure that it all fits and notice i have the uh, quotes around there because this does come from italy it's a lot cheaper or more affordable i should say it's not cheap um, than traditional ribbon still works just as well and for something that's temporary and only has to last you know two to four weeks i'm okay if it's not the you know fancy fancy name brand stuff because there's no difference otherwise so the first thing we're going to do is start the etching process using phosphoric acid to make it so that we have something to bond to on the teeth themselves. No need to place a rubber dam here or anything like this. There's thousands of ortho appliances that have to last a lot longer than two to four weeks <laughs> that are on here. I like to go plus two teeth on either side. So you notice I went all the way to five. That way we can pick up number seven and eight. And then it just makes sense to me. The canines are the biggest tooth up there and they have some of the strongest bonding spots. So for me, it makes sense to extend it over to the canines. So most of the time I will be doing plus two teeth on either side of the traumatized teeth, as well as picking up the canines on both sides, just to make sure everything's nice and stable. Now I Notice there that that didn't look quite as perfect with the vitrobon down in the sulcus. One of the things with any trauma is you do not want to leave any composite or other materials near the gingival sulcus because that can serve as a nidus for inflammation, which means more bacteria, and we don't want that. So I'm just taking my 01 tuber, really gently brushing this off, making sure that the that it's a nice smooth surface. This tooth is going to be extracted anyway, so it's not that big of a deal that it's a, you know, glass ionomer that we didn't, you know, etch and do all that. I'm just using this for stability right now. And with trauma, sometimes you just have to plan that, okay, this needs to last for just a few weeks while everything else stabilizes. But I wouldn't send her to get this tooth extracted right away. This is still a decent tooth and we still have some use out of it. So as you can see, nice etched spots on all of those teeth. And now we are ready to start the process. So how I'm going to do this, I will start off by placing the bonding agent. I'm using the universal. This is one of those cases where the universal agent is very fantastic because it's just the one. You don't have to wait for one, two, or three, you know, multiple steps. This is why ortho has used universal bonding agents for a very long time. And just making sure I get enough on seven and eight because those are the two teeth that we really need to stabilize. Air thin with the air only strop code to make sure we get a nice small amount of bonding agent there. And then like here, it's really straightforward as far as this part. Um, the ortho assistants who are watching this, hey, why are you watching this? But if you are, shout, shout out in the comments. <laughs> but ortho assistants are probably like, oh my God, he's doing this cell wrong. And compared to what you, you all do every day, yes, I'm, I'm probably am. But this works great for the trauma and that's what we're working on here. So like here, all of that. And then we're going to start the process of splinting the teeth. So when I do this, I want to stabilize the splint with the solid teeth first then come back and do the traumatized teeth. So what you'll see here, and I was, this, there, sorry, there's a few more delays in this one than normal. Um, this is the first time I had done a trauma case with this assistant. So I was trying to walk her through all the different steps because while we do see a fair amount of trauma, it's most of the time I'm not making splints. So I only make probably four or five splints a year, maybe. We, we tend to be able to manage things 
in a different way where they've already been managed for us. This is just one where I caught them pretty quickly. So we're coming in right now with just regular flowable. I think she actually used the opaquer instead of the <laughs> A1, but it's okay. It, it, it's temporary. It doesn't matter. Notice I skipped seven and eight. That's on purpose because what I'm doing is I'm going to stabilize the splint first then attach the not the teeth that are traumatized so what you do is you gently just push it down into the composite as you can see and that will start the process it's okay if it moves a little bit that's pretty common and it's okay if it doesn't stick up usually you have to hold it in place for this first part here you can see that number five just wants to go flying off on me so what i'm doing is holding everything kind of stabilized the assistant will then come in with the light cure and i'm being very cautious to make sure none of this is near the gingiva you want it to be high enough that it's not near the gums because once again any inflammation in there can serve for anitis for bacteria to enter which is exactly what we do not want to have happen and you'll notice maybe it's a little tough to see I am holding number five back in place as well because that one was a little bit loose and this is just a quick snap cure to start the process I think we do 20 seconds for maybe the entire thing but now that is the start of a stabilized splint to make sure that it stays nice and strong you then take another layer of flowable on top of it and that goes through the resin and kind of forms a really nice stable bond pretty much if you do this with fishing wire or ortho wire what you would do is just make your droplets a little bit bigger in the first place and then push the wire or the ortho wire all the way through sometimes you'll still have to add a little bit extra but for this process with the ribbon like material it's best to add a little bit on top as well and it will also smooth it allows you to smooth it off without having to uh, use any burrs or anything like that because the flowable is so smooth and kind of just creates a smooth surface to begin with i don't think i really do much as far as adjustment on these teeth at all so at this point now we have a stable splint three teeth to the left of the traumatized teeth and two teeth to the right and now we're going to start that process so because they were displaced you know, lingually I can actually just get behind it as you can see and notice eight is now a little bit more stable because of that composite in the front really only seven is the tooth that moves there and I'm going to push it all the way forward into the spot so that we get as tight of a contact as possible with root fractures the key is to make sure that you get those two pieces approximated as closely together as possible because that's less of a gap that the body has to repair the most ideal way for root fractures to Repair is a hard bony connection between the two teeth. Obviously the worst is soft tissue, but as long as we get stability, the prognosis on root fractures is much, much, much higher than anyone actually thinks. So what I'm doing here is checking with my finger to see if there's any rough, sharp spots. And really it wasn't bad at all. Everything felt really, really smooth. So I decided not to go back in, just leave the nice composite and the smoothness. And you can see those teeth are now stable, stable, stable. Okay, what is the final thing we have to do? It's me, so you know it's just the occlusion. <laughs> this is the other thing that's incredibly important with these traumatized teeth is you do not want to have them in the occlusion at all so especially number eight because it's going to be extracted any mark on there in any direction is getting removed and I'm also going to reshape those lower incisors so that we have a little bit more a little less sharp spots you can see that you know with age comes wear and some shifting most people's lower incisors have a little bit of wear and crowding and by taking this big barrel burr, it's a great way to remove anything while leaving a soft, smooth surface that's not going to bug the patient. If you did this with like a flat disc or something, you could create a little sharp spot. But I've really found that this barrel burr works extremely, extremely well for this sort of thing. So that's all we're doing here, smoothing off those spots. I didn't like the shape of that canine, so I reprofiled it a little bit. And this is not removing a ton of tooth structure. What I'm doing here is just making sure that she's going to avoid these teeth. And I really want to see that pull through, almost like shim style with an implant also if we just give every tooth every root canal treated tooth implant occlusion we'd have a tenth of the problems that we do with them but that's a different story as well so that's what we're doing here adjusting 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 and I, i'm going to keep it all in i know it's going to be annoying for you to see how long it takes for me to get this bite perfect but this is truly besides the splint and making sure they're on a soft diet one of the most important things for root fractures is get the occlusion 
perfect. And by perfect, I mean nothing touching in centric, lateral, or protrusive. And remember, patients go into some very weird bites. They they sometimes they'll go out beyond protrusive. They'll go out beyond excursive. So. Look at the wear patterns, try to figure out if the patients have any parafunctional habits, anything like that, because if you want this to fail, you would leave these teeth in occlusion and let them get pounded to death. The other thing I mentioned earlier, we do put these patients on a soft diet for the full four weeks, sometimes longer. You don't want these teeth to have any real force applied to them. It's okay for them to have what's called physiologic force. And that's just the movement of, you know, the tongue, the lip. That's why we don't do hard, uh, rigid splints anymore is because we found there was a higher risk of resorption because you need a little bit of that movement to help reform the cementum and PDL. And if you do a completely ankylosed splint, more or less, that there's a higher risk of resorption. So that's why that has changed if you're not up to date on your uh, trauma guidelines. Go watch my video on that. I did just do one on the most recent guidelines for the residents. And what we're testing now is protrusive, as you can see. Uh, maybe she kind of, she thinks she has trouble going into protrusive, which is probably a good sign, actually. Um, if they if they don't do it when you ask it to, they're not going to do it otherwise. So that's what it looks like when it's all stabilized. I just wanted to quick show you. This is what the X-ray looked like after, so you can barely even see the attachments there. Um, look at how that crack is really improved. Looks really good. So thank you all so much for watching. And actually, it took me so long to make this video, she came back for the recall. <laughs> so here we are two weeks after, just wanted to show everybody what this looks like here. So this is how I'm gonna test these teeth after to make sure that we still have some stability. I'll start off by checking mobility with two, and you can see they're still very, very solid, which is great. Really no mobility on this teeth at all. Still do my normal test of pushing on it. Um, you can see eight is still sensitive, and that's not a surprise to me whatsoever. Just check those gums, make sure everything looks good there. Um, you can see the filling held on, which is all that I really needed it to do. And the splint is looking great. Now, nothing's popped off. Everything's holding on really, really nicely. So that leads us to our final test that we do for every recall. Are these teeth still feeling cold? I'm still going to test all six teeth because it you never know with trauma how long it takes for something to come back. And I always do a very quick little bit right there because I don't want them to feel anything. Um, you can see, not really feeling it. Most importantly, no response on number eight, which isn't a surprise given how high up that fracture was. However, let's talk about number seven. I am very pleased to report that she actually feels cold on this tooth. That is a very, very, very good sign. It does take a little bit, but you can see that nodding head. So I will post probably just in a single picture when I see her back in a few weeks, but I've already talked with the general dentist she's going to be going in and getting that tooth extracted he's going to do another rib on splint on the lingual while she waits for the implant and we'll go from there anyway thank you all so much for watching if you have any questions drop a question below otherwise i'll talk to you all next time